proudly the silver dolphin puts to sea to hunt for herring here on the west coast of Newfoundland. She's a saner, one of the few British Columbian vessels to remain here after the herring bonanza of the late 60s collapsed. John Hackett of Benoit's Cove in the Bay of Islands owns the Silver Dolphin now, but he had quite a struggle to get her. 300,000 dollars was a lot of money to try to raise back 12 years ago. But John Hackett had grown to know and love this beautiful vessel they call the Silver Dolphin. He had to have her. National Sea was building up the same fleet at the time. So the, I, I was interested, so they knew I was interested in the team, so they backed me up. But before that, prior to that, I tried to get the money to the Newfoundland Loan Board, and I guess at that time they, they weren't prepared to give out that much money to an individual fisherman, which was $300,000. In fact, the, the guy I was talking at the time, he just but told me I, I had to be sick to be looking for that much money. Not, not in them words, but that's really what it meant. So the wife, I, she didn't realize that there was this much money and, uh, you know, what I was going to pay this much money for a boat. She figured it was only a small thing, small long line or something, worth ten or $12,000. And when I told her it was 300000 she actually got sick over it. She really did. She ended up in the hospital. She, she just, we was going to be out on the street. We were going to starve to death. I was crazy and everything else. She thinks different now. I, I wasn't really sure where I was going at the time. How could you be? But I, I had a dream, I suppose, and I wanted to fulfill it. What a master. The Silver Dolphin is one of a fleet of six large herring sailors that fish together and market cooperatively. They are the big fellows of the industry, the mobile fleet. There's the Canada Park, the Canada 100, the Eastern Pride, the Lady Patricia, the Silver Dolphin. And that old veteran, the Lavalie, skippered by Kirk Anderson. Lavalie, Silver Dolphin. Did you find John? Yes, sir. Good morning, Skip. What are you doing this morning? Steaming around, waiting for you to make good set. <laughs> Hope you're right, Skip, boy. Don't seem to be that lucky this morning. We're not having seen it in so far over. Uh, we got our pump all adjusted back. Took the clearance out of it yesterday, so we'll do a good job. I think we made some improvements. We'll make some more first chance we get now, so we're getting geared up for pumping over. Yeah, good enough. I just heard Tone and uh, Les on there. I don't know if they're seeing anything over. Okay. Canada Park. What do you see? Uh, I'm seeing stuff raggedy looking. Could be good here. I'm just saying, it was in a good spot if I would try it. But there's not enough to warrant trying it there on that bottom over. I see, yeah. Yeah, you never know. You never know. See you anyway. Good enough, then we're soaking it towards you. Let's see what we can see. Or over. A bit of it around or whatever it is. Oh, it is. Yeah, very good. Electronics is an important part of the fishing game these days. Besides the radios and the radar, there's pretty sophisticated fish finding equipment. An experienced skipper can read what's ahead of him and home in pretty accurately on a school of fish. Yeah, well this is a, a, it's a long range sonar, sea tech here, eh? And I got it on the thousand meter range now, so that's a the short of half a mile. We find the fish on the long range sonar, then we bring it in on the short range, the Westmire, which we use that on the 800 feet. It's ideal for setting the same, you know, because when you make a circle, you, you're making probably a race of 800 feet, you know. So that's generally the idea of it. It's long range for searching and, and short range for the set of sailing. 
It's a lucky day for the silver dolphin. She's the first to find a good school of herring. John Hackett and his crew get ready to shoot the seine. The skiff is poised on the stern like a good water dog, eager to go. All hands await the word of the skipper as he maneuvers the silver dolphin into position. Well, you're towing the skiff around. That's attached to the end of the seine, eh? And there's two men in the, in the power skiff. And uh, that, well, when you dropped into the seine, the two men in the skiff, so you make this circle around. You pick them up again, each oil line, take you, and then you send to your boat, eh? So the time you shoots them away to you get back and picks them up again, you know, you've had no more contact with them, you know what I mean? And more especially night time anymore, and you just see the, the light in the power skiff. The same we're using now is approximately 335 in length and about uh, 50 fathom, 45, 50 fathom in depth. And uh, we can set that in, we have the bottom is good, we can set that in 3 to 4 fathom water. Now the bottom got to be good for that, eh? Uh, outside of that, well, when the bottom is dropped, we got to make sure we got at least 25, 30 fathom. In fact, we'd like to have 35 or better. Now the skiff uh, holes in that, and you circle, is that, or does That's the skiff right. circle with the net? No, no, the boat, the saner makes a circle, the skiff is just, she just goes stern, just to more or less use as a sea anchor. And once the seine is, is sea more and more or less, then the skiff turn around and just tow slow on the end, towards the boat. Well, the seine has been set, a wall of netting encircles the fish, hopefully, but there's no guarantees. Much depends on the skill of the skipper, and I suppose on the cleverness of the herring. But once the seine has been set, there's nothing to do but take it in, herring or no herring. The skiff men have a new job now, they move around to the other side of the seiner and with a tow line keep the vessel from drifting over the seine. It keeps the seiner in proper position for taking back the net. Without the skiff, there could be some awful snarls. Well, you're shooting that seine over the stern, you're shooting away a purse for it to the bottom of it, eh? So then you start and um, purse it to the bottom together on, on, the, on the winch, then you form when you when you have your rings brought up to the day, you have a big bag for them. So your herring is out in that bag. So then you start uh, from what we call the table end. That's to be the back end of the boat. Put that into the block power block. And you keep rolling that on the stern until you crowd all the herring up in one end of the, the same. So you can crowd them together and then see that you can pump them. Now, uh, now trap fishermen say sometimes they got a, a dry haul. Do you... Uh do you ever have that kind of thing? Well, I suppose you call it dry, how we call it skunk. Donut, I call it. <laughs> but, uh, oh yes, lots of times you sit after a bunch of herring and deer and got a tendency to be wild and moving around quite a lot, you know. And you don't stay in the circle, so if you don't stay in the circle, you don't get them. Sometimes you go on the bottom of deep water uh, underneath the same, so unless you don't take them. I think the herring will try to outmaneuver you it's the same as you're trying to outmaneuver them. Because, like I said before, I think herring is, is, is sort of a lot of intelligence about them. It seems like they, they'll do things, you know, opposite what you'll do. It's just you think you know something about a herring, you know nothing. Because he'll do something different. When enough twine has been dried up and the herring bunched together, the pump is lowered, and the herring sucked on board. We rip the stain in the bottom ending. If it's not too serious altogether, we, we pull that out the front side of the table. And then we just take a needle and we just reef it up for them, you know, not, not a permanent job, sort of, but we just fix it. So
so it's saying it's still back in fishing on it. So almost every time you put one of those purse things over the stern, it's just sort of an adventure to it. Eh? Uh, you hardly get two sets that's identical alike. It's always some little thing, even the, the snarls are different. So I got to light at least one or two cigarettes to catch you, catch hearing. I suppose that's for that reason I'll never quit smoking. The other vessels of the mobile fleet circle around nearby, waiting, wondering. It is a lovely, eh? And, and uh, when we get a big set like this, and we know we can't handle it all in this boat, we can't take it all here, so, you know, as soon as we start pumping, we'll get some kind of a handle on what we got, so when we know we can't take it, we'll uh, call one of uh, the buddies on side, either Kirk or one of the other boats. Once we get a droid in line side and we start pumping, he's coming in, get on our cork, and we tie the two boats together, use the power skips to keep them apart so they won't bump one another. His power skips tow on one side, and my power skips tow on the other side of me, so that tows the boats apart. So we don't bump one another like that, damage the boats. And we can handle it pretty rough water. We've, we've had boats together in 30 mile of wind, never damaged one another. This cooperative fishing effort is something new for me. Back when this fishery began, there was a mad race to the grounds and savage competition for the herring. Many boats refused to share. There was a lot of dumping, a lot of waste, but not anymore. Even right now, we're, we're pulling our fish together, right? The six boats. We still like to show one another, you know, I, I probably like to catch the whole quota and share with those fellas. And you know, they got the same feeling. You and Kirk have been on the on the grounds quite a bit together, haven't you, over the years? Well, we've been all cats together back in boyhood days, I guess. We learned one another and discussed everything together. And if I come up with something good that worked good for me, he'd copy it, and naturally I'd do the same and with him. And Kirk is very bright on anything like that too, you know. So we taught one another. Self intellectual, that's what you want to call it. Now, he's been fishing a bit longer than you have, but now I guess you're, you must be creeping up there with tonnage yourself. He's, he's known as the, as the real old dog for the herring, but I suppose you're, you're getting there yourself too now. Well, I, I, haven't, I never haven't got so much fish caught as Kirk now over the years, but uh, oh, yeah, I don't think there's any other boat around the East Coast that have the production in, uh, you know, since the first thing started as, as Kirk had. Uh, you know, my production's getting up there, but nothing compared to his. I dare say by the time you retire now, you'll have landed quite a few herring, though. Well, if I had it all to settle for today, I, I think I'd retire now. <laughs> I don't think you could. I think you like it too much. <laughs> it's hard to do, isn't it, right? <laughs> okay. Here's the Lavalie fishing herring on the southwest coast in 1967. Captain Kirk Anderson was already a bit of a legend as a herring fisherman. On this old converted minesweeper, he constantly outfished the more modern BC saners. The herring was all converted to fish meal in those days. $18 a ton the fishermen got. They had no choice but fish hard. Some boats landed 20,000 tons a year. That's more than the entire West Coast quota in 1982. Today, we wouldn't do that. But at that time, there was no other market but fish meal. And fish meal, you have to have a high capacity if you're going to make any money, make the thing pay. So the fish that we caught there the last year was around 13, 14 years old, and they're getting up just about as long as they're going to live anyway. So if it wasn't caught, they wouldn't be there. Well, I don't see any significant change in the abundance of air. We're under much tighter control, and uh, some areas Herring is a little scarce now, the large herring. There's plenty of herring. I never saw so much small fish before. And uh, I've been 15 years fishing herring, and I never saw this much small fish before. So I take that as an indicator of, uh, of uh, a good future. Well, 
it's a little tiny bit of a disappointment in Bay St. George this, uh, this spring because uh, we're not seeing that much uh, large mature fish, but you know, we're seeing abundance of small, eh? So this looks good down the road. But you take the case of Port of Port Bay there, that, that was the only way I can explain it, a place was full of herring this spring. There was a real large school of herring in Port of Port. You know, when, when, when you set, make six sets with a purse thing, Catch approximately three thousand ton of herring or better. I, I somebody better realize that there's a bunch of fish there. The mobile fleet cooperates closely with the biologists in providing information, in helping them assess the herring stocks. They welcome controls. They're the last ones who would want to see the herring overfished. Yet they don't always agree with the way the quotas are set, the way the lines are drawn. John is fond of saying. The herring has no fixed address. He feels there isn't enough flexibility in the herring management plan. But the biggest worry of the mobile fleet skippers is the fact that they're often seen as the bad guys. They are the brunt of criticism and abuse by small boat fixed gear fishermen. If there's no herring in the nets, blame the mobile fleet. They feel there's a constant threat. They'll be squeezed out of business. They're few in numbers. They don't have as many votes. It's an uncomfortable feeling to be a saner skipper these days. If the government had to say no more purse saning on the west coast of Newfoundland, 90% uh, of the fish plants in western Newfoundland would be out of business. You know, it is, that's what the mobility is needed to It's the backbone industry. You've got the support of, of, the, of the fish plants behind you all the time. You know, they're telling the government, you know, don't, don't do away with that purse saning fleet. You do, you put us, up, put us out of business. You know, a fixed gear fishery, okay, if the herring don't come to their nets or to your doorstep, well, you just don't get them, but with mobility, we don't care where they're at, we'll, we'll eventually find them. On the wild and wasteful ocean It's out there on the deep that we harvest our bread As we hunt the bunny shores of heaven it was on a fair and a pleasant day Out of Yarmouth Harbour I was faring As a cabin boy on a sailing lugger For to hunt the bunny shoals of Heron Oh, we left the home grounds in the month of June And for canny shields we soon were faring with a hundred crown of the silver darlings that we taken from the shoals of heaven. Now the work was hard and the hours were long, and the treatment sure it took some bearing. And I used to sleep standing on my feet, and I dream about the shoals of heaven. The stormy seas and the living gales I am the gear that I was wearing Sail ten thousand miles, got ten million fishes As we hunted for the shoals of herring It's another good set, another big haul of herring Another good day's pay for John Hackett and the crew of the Silver Dolphin. The crew will be with me the majority of many way ever since I had the boat, and uh, they know the boat pretty well. And uh, it takes quite a burden off of my shoulders when I haven't got to be down there and directing everybody to do every little thing. In fact, the uh, majority can go ahead and fish the boat their own self now, and a couple of them have done it. So it's, it's pretty good to me that way. Oh, it's a good, it's a good help to have an experienced crew with you. That means everything.
Well, when we started the catching for meal years ago, it was $18 a ton plus 15% then for this year's they would charge. And then I guess uh, with the collapse of the North Sea herring there, the, the Europeans started looking to Canada for herring. And I guess Newfoundland herring were always good quality, so uh, Newfoundland ended up uh, getting a fair shot at that market. It practically overnight, well, within, I wouldn't say overnight, within a year anyway, it turned from a meal fishery into a food, food fishery, you say. So the prices started then from $30 a ton for food. Now, I think in one year it went from 30 to 100. And in the next couple of years it went from that 100 up to, well, the peak, I guess, was 325, 325 a ton. Then the North Sea started coming back. They started getting herring again, so the Europeans wasn't taking so much, so Marcus used to get glutted, so naturally when Marcus started getting glutted, he started coming looking for cheaper fish, till the day is back to $195 a ton again. So I suppose this is supply and demand sort of thing. How much can your vessel carry now, and, and uh, how much do you get in the set sometimes? Well, the, the dolphin carry, carrying for food, we say we get around 225, 230 ton out. Kirk's boat carry about uh, 265 to Canada 100, practically the same myself, maybe a few more. But we have one big boat in the fleet, the, the Canada Club there, or Canada Park. We can carry around practically 600 tons, so that's a good thing, especially when you get the big bunch of herring in, in, in the net, big sets, because you know there's, there's definitely no need then for your short end is not coming any dump. So it's easy for you to get the more in a set than your boat can carry, that oh, happens often? quite often quite often, especially nowadays uh, when herrings in spawn because they're in high density schools, so you know, it's very easy to get three or four or five hundred tons set. And that's a load for two vessels? That's, yes, and probably some for one of the other boats. But we watch that real close, we're real careful on that one because it's just something we, I don't think in, yes, since the years of the South West Coast that ever been any herring dump. I know those six boats are working it now that we were really careful over that. This fishery is now managed pretty tightly, with quotas for the inshore fixed gear fishermen as well as for the bigger boats. 9,000 tons the mobile fleet is allowed to take, and even this is broken down into zones. The mobile fleet may fish only on the west coast of Newfoundland. And western Newfoundland is where it all began. This is the real uh, home for the, for the saners, isn't it? Over here it always has been. Well, for the mobile saner, that's, that's, it, it is the home of the mobile saner in Newfoundland, eh? That's you know, over 65 foot thing. I suppose it's on account of what happened years ago with the southwest coast. We bought boats and stayed with it. We still like to be competitive fishermen, you know. But that today the competitive fishermen in, in person is gone, you know, when you're down to boat quotas and someone tells you time to go fishing and when to come in and how much to catch, so you know, how can you be a competitive fisherman anymore? The mobile fleet. They've caught a lot of fish in their time, and they're still going strong. A bit shaky now, perhaps, in these days of quota juggling and sector management, but still hopeful, still looking forward to another good season. Herring seining has been good to these men. They've worked hard, and they've done well. It was a big gamble John Hackett took 12 years ago when he sank everything he had into buying the Silver Dolphin. But it's paid off, and not just in terms of money. It's a way of life, it's excitement, it's a dream come true. I, I would say, per se, and we've often discussed this between ourselves, you know, that this is adventurous, almost every set, there's some little thing about it different, fish work different, your gear work different. It's an adventure.
But I wasn't really sure where I was going at the time. How could you be? But I, I had a dream, I suppose, and I wanted to fulfill what amounts to.